Welcome everyone to Diabetes Canada's 2017 webinar series. My name is Farah Ismail and I will be your host for today. We're delighted that you're able to join us for the webinar to learn about Living Well with Diabetes, a Chinese Perspective. Now to start off, I'd like to draw your attention to our survey. It's located at the top right-hand section of your screen. In order for us to better serve your needs, we kindly ask that you provide us with your input by completing the short survey towards the end of the presentation and we thank you in advance for your input. Throughout the presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions, and that can be done by typing in the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom right-hand section of your screen. And we ask that you use this for any questions you have along the way, and our speaker will be happy to answer them at the end of our presentation. As well, I will be going through a few polling questions at the beginning of our presentation today, and we'd love for your participation. Please note that your answers will remain completely anonymous. Also note that you're able to customize your screens to expand or collapse them as you see fit, and this can be done by simply dragging down the bottom right-hand corner of each of the webinar pods. Our presentation today will last about 45 minutes in length and we'll have 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. We are recording today's presentation and it will be made available on our website at www.diabetes.ca. So as promised, I'd like to start us off with our first polling question. So if you can let us know, how are you affected by diabetes? If you can select any option that does apply, I'll give everyone a minute to fill that out. Great, and it looks like everyone has responded, so thank you for letting us know which category you fit in best. And if you can let us know how you're participating today, are you participating as an individual, in a group of two to five, or in a group of six or more? And if you can click Submit once you've responded, that would be great. And thank you all for responding to that. It looks like a majority of people today are participating as an individual. Well, we'd like to welcome everyone today, and now I'd like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Lau, and thank him for joining us today. But before I turn it over to Dr. Lau, I'd like to give you a brief introduction. Dr. Lau is a medical graduate from the University of Hong Kong and a fellow of Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. He's been a volunteer and an advocate for Diabetes Canada for over 12 years and is the ex-chairman and current member of the Chinese Advisory Committee in Vancouver. For more information on Dr. Lau, please read the speaker bio section and that's located to the left of your screen. So without further ado, I present to you Dr. Lau. Thank you, Farah, for your kind introduction. It gives me great pleasure and honor to participate in this webinar on a subject very close to my heart as a physician and also as a patient of diabetes. So in the next hour, I'm going to give a paint at the landscape of diabetes in 2017 now. Then I will give my view of what is diabetes before I focus on diabetes in Chinese in relation to the incident, the culture, the diet, and even touch on how we should use herbal medicine, which is so commonly used among the Chinese. And finally, I give my strategy how to prevent and control diabetes, Chinese like myself. As we all know, on the 13th of February this year, Canadian Diabetes Association is changed to Diabetes Canada for a very good reason, because there's been a lot of change in the landscape of diabetes since 1953 when CDA was found. Of course, over those so many years, the incidence of diabetes has increased. For the type 1 diabetes, it increased with the proportion of 
increase in the population. But the type 2 diabetes is a different story. Now we have an exponential rise, not only in the figure is so astonishing, but we are seeing also a much younger age of onset. 30 years ago, I used to see type 2 diabetes in the 50s and 60s. Now we are seeing it in teenagers or even in children. The implication is very serious because if these children and teenagers are not able to control the diabetes, it takes 15, 20 years when they get into all the complications of diabetes. And I know very well about the complication since I worked for 28 years in an intensive care of Burnaby Hospital. So let us look at the history of diabetes in Canada. We started off in 1921 when Dr. Benting and Dr. Best discovered insulin, and as we all know, it saved so many millions of lives since. By 1983, CDA was found. The idea at that time is more focused on the type 1 diabetes, although their life has been prolonged, but all the nasty complications appear and I know very well what they are. The type 2 diabetes was in the background, and in fact, the first pill of, for type 2 diabetes was not even discovered until 54, the, the sulfonuria product came out, similar to what we are taking, glyburide and dimicron, and then in 57, metformin came. Now, fast forward to this year, 2017, we have more than 400 million of diabetic patients in this world. And Canada has 11 million of diabetic as well as pre-diabetic, which means one in three of us. A majority of this are type 2 diabetes. And there's much higher incidence in the Aboriginal as well as an immigrants from China and India. In type 1 diabetes, we know that in the European population, in 100 patients with diabetes, there's about 10 of them have type 1. But the Chinese have much less incidence, and it should be less than 5% so far. In fact, we are lucky in this way that we don't have so much autoimmune disease, although we get more trouble with autoimmune disease, autoimmune disease in thyroid and lupus. Then look at the diabetes in the Chinese population and compare with the rest of Canada. It's about 7% for the rest of Canada but in China, especially in the urban city like Shanghai, the incident as high as 11.6%. And even in the rural area where the villagers have a different diet and they're more active, it's still 8%. In total, there are now 114 millions of Chinese with diabetes and probably more because not all of them have been diagnosed. And this will account for one-third of the world population of diabetes. A study came out in 2013 in Toronto. The study is to look at the new incidence of diabetes between the year 1996 and 2003. A total of 77,000 Canadians were studied now the figure shows, in 1996, of 10,000 people studied, there's about 7.8% European new onset of diabetes in that year. For the Chinese, it's lower. It was, and it's down to 1. Point, it's only 1.3 out of 10,000. But for the year 2003, the figure changed. Not so much for the Europeans which stayed slightly higher 
at 9.7 per 10,000, but the Chinese jumped from 19 points to 15.6. This is alarming. So why there are more diabetes in Chinese? Well, look at our Chinese culture. Each time when we meet a friend or relative, we don't say, how are you? We say, have you eaten? Because eating is our first priority. And it's understandable because for thousands of years, Chinese has gone through many periods of famine, war, and starvation. In fact, the last big one was in the early 60s, where a record of 36 million of Chinese died of famine and starvation. So our ancestors is very clever to select the one that can survive by having genes that help them to absorb food more efficiently and store them. Another way of looking at it is perhaps we can blame our parents because we are more prone to develop insulin resistance, meaning that insulin we produce is not efficient and we are not able to store fat in the proper pace, place and we put it all into our tummy. Or maybe we have less number of beta cells that makes insulin at birth. But I think it's more to do with the environment. When we are exposed to a different diet in the Western world and we are living a very good life, not doing much physical activities. So what is diabetes? In my mind, uh, we have trillions of cells. Each one needs glucose for energy, just like the gasoline of a car. And we need insulin to transport glucose into the cell. But if we don't have enough insulin, the blood glucose rise, and it's given all the complications, and it spills into the urine as well. So let us look at our pancreas, which produces insulin. Now, pancreas is an organ about the size of my palm, tucked be behind the stomach and just below it. 98% of the pancreas is used to produce an enzyme for digesting fat and is excreted and secreted into the gut. And only a small percentage of the pancreas, amounting to about 2%, makes hormones. And they are scattered in the form of small little islets. There's about, about a million of them, and each one may have 500 to 5,000 cells. And there's quite a few number of cells, different types of cells. The more important one are the A and B cell. The B cell is the one beta cell that makes insulin. And the alpha cell is the one that makes glucagon. Now this is just like a yin yang story. Insulin puts the glucose into the cell. Glucagon is the other hormone that dumps the, the excess glucose in the form of glycogen back into the cell so to make sure that we have always a constant amount of glucose in the blood that we don't pass out when the brain is not giving enough insulin. So I look at diabetes not just a disease of sugar and insulin, but actually it is a disease of two hormones, insulin and glucagon, and glucagon has been a neglected hormone for a long time. Now when the pancreas secrete insulin and glucagon, the first place they go to is not the rest of the body, it's to the liver for a very good reason. Because the liver is the organ that receives all the food or nutrient coming from our food. And if you need instruction what to do with all this glucose, protein and fat. 
So insulin is help to get the glucose into the liver cells, use it up or store it, and it also tell the liver convert some of the excess glucose into fat as well, and also makes protein. And glucagon did the opposite. So when the sugar is low in the blood, it breaks down the glycogen in the liver and put, about, put it out to the blood to maintain constant amount of glucose. We all know that two types of diabetes, the type 1, young ones, they have no more beta cells from autoimmune disease destroying them. And the, old one, the type 2 are the older one, although now it's getting uh, younger. And the reason is not just because of the insulin, uh, the pancreas, the beta cells not doing well. It starts off first by developing this insulin resistance, which I look at it as our Canadian dollars. We are now 74 cents to a dollar US. So we need more insulin and when we have too much demand on the insulin supply, the beta cell starts falling. So in my mind, type 2 diabetes is a simple formula is equal to insulin resistance plus insulin deficiency. This is completely graph, but let me explain. It shows the life cycle of a type 2 diabetic patient like myself. The vertical axis show the percentage of beta cell working on the very top is 100% and the bottom is zero. The horizontal axis is the years of diabetes, it goes for 10, 20, 30 years. Now when we started, we have 100% of beta cell. As the number falling down, we develop what we call pre-diabetic. First of all, impaired glucose tolerance, meaning we wake up in the morning with high glucose. And the next stage is when we eat a heavy meal, our glucose goes up beyond 10. And by the time when we really become a type 2 diabetes, we actually have lost 50% of the beta cell already. So when a patient was first diagnosed to have diabetes, the patient should not congratulate himself or herself, oh, I have only mild diabetes. Actually, you lost 50% of your pancreatic function already. This is another slide to show that type 2 diabetes is the tip of the iceberg. What we saw in type 2 diabetes is only a few hundred feet glacier floating, but deep down there may be a thousand feet below. Now look at the very bottom of the slide. It starts off, everything is normal. 100% sensitivity of insulin, that means the dollar is 100% equal to the American dollar. And then we are making 100% of insulin, so pretty normal. We go to the next stages when the effect of the insulin devaluate to 70%, but that time it's still okay because the beta cell is making more, up to 150%. So when you go for a blood test, perfectly normal. Then we move to the upper level when the insulin effect is only 50%, and by this time the beta cell fail, and the secretion not able to meet the demand, this is where the pre-diabetic is, and finally we became a diabetic moving up to the top level. So insulin resistance, what gives it to give us insulin resistance? It's basically ectopic fat. Now, mind you, obesity doesn't mean diabetes. A lot of people who are oversized, as long as they have make enough insulin, they're not diabetic. It's the one that is having fat in the wrong place. 
And I should stress that among uh, we Chinese, we don't need to be very obese. Our tummy don't need to be 40 inches. Even 36, 34, or 36 or 38, it can be a problem because this is the ectopic fat that gives us the insulin resistance, not the fat in our buttock, legs and arms. We can see this what happened to evolution of man in the modern society. And you, this slide, I want to show you how effective a fat cell can store fat. It can store up to 98% of its volume, squeezing the cell to the very rim, which occupies something like 2% only. Now, why that the atopic fat is so bad is because it's in a location where there's too much fat cell, not enough oxygen to supply them. So they die. When they die, it becomes rubbish. So the body will send in all the white blood cell inflammatory agent produced called cytokine, and those are the chemical thing that give us all the complication. As well, you can see when the tank is full, it spills out, and the fat goes to the liver. They also go to the muscle, heart, and pancreas. So not only fatty liver, it's fatty muscle, heart, and pancreas. So what are the symptoms of diabetes? Well, it's, diabetes is a silent disease. And your blood sugar goes up to 13 or more before you spill it in the urine. Then you become tired, you're thirsty, you urinate a lot, frequently day and night. And then this is an acute stage. But in a chronic stage, meaning that after years of high sugar, you get all the complications. And this is a, a slide that probably all of you are familiar with. So you get complications from the head to the toes, your stroke, your eye blindness, and your feet amputated, your heart attack, and the kidney failure. Now there's a study just came out on the 8th of March from the University of New York. They studied the incidence of cancer among diabetic Asians that include China, Korea, Japan, and India. It's a 12-year study, and they monitor more than 800,000 patients, and not, not patients, but people, whether they, they, some of them, they don't have diabetes, the others they have. And the average age of those not being monitored were about 50 years old they found that those people during these 12 years, they develop a cancer. If they don't have diabetes, they only have a bit more, it was about 2,694, whereas the one who have diabetes, the incidence of cancer is much higher, 34,000, 26% risk. Now compared with the European population of the same size and age, the European have only 7% incident, not 26% for male, and 11% for female. So, having seen so many things, bad things about type 2 diabetes, what can we do about it? Well, again, look at this simple formula. Type 2 diabetes equal to insulin resistance and insulin deficiency. So, the first thing we do is to get rid of this insulin resistance get our dollars back to the one-to-one. -one. So the way to do that is to get rid of atopic fat. And of course, the first thing we do is I adhere to my diet and I have to exercise. And if it's no, not good enough, you start thinking of medication. And in those grossly obese, three or four hundred pounds, you may need bypass, intestinal bypass surgery. The other way to look at it is to preserve our beta cells. Maybe we were lucky, unlucky enough that we don't have as much beta cell as other people, but we want to keep them alive by not drawing too much demand from them so that we don't eat a lot of carbohydrate, the refined carbohydrates that would demand a lot of insulin. And of course, we don't want to give toxin 
to the beta cell, and the common toxins are sugar and fat. And we also avoid some medication that may be dangerous to the pancreas cell. And one thing that I always worry about when I use sulfonylurea, glybride and dimicron, because those pills squeeze on the beta cell and relentlessly, 24 hours a day, secrete insulin out at times that we may not even eat ins insulin in between. And insulin itself is, can be a dangerous thing because if we are overuse insulin, we are converting the liver to be a very good factory of making fat. And this is a fat that we don't want. So get rid of ectopic fat is the balance that in and out. So what I do is, I remember my mother telling me, don't eat so fast. So now I try to chew 16 times each time when I have a mouthful of food. This will slow down the absorption of food, slow down the rate of invasion of glucose into our blood so that the pancreas can handle it. And of course, we should use smaller bowls rather than big bowls of rice, smaller plates, six or eight inches better. And then in terms of eating the meals, I always have a substantial breakfast and very small amount for supper. The worst that we do to ourselves is to go out to the restaurant in the evening, go to too many banquets, 10 courses, and that is dynamite. Then I try to reward myself with dessert only on special occasions. The worst thing to do is to have a big dessert at dinner time because you will encourage the body to use those high sugar for energy with no attempt to burn the fat in my tummy when I'm fasting and sleeping at night. What is sugar? Now I should pay attention to sugar because I consider sugar is like tobacco. Sugar can be broken down in our gut into glucose and fructose. And sugar now can be produced massively and cheaply. 500 years ago, Colombia, uh, Colombo went to the South America and Central America and discovered that it can be obtained from sugar cane. And then it also came from beet later on. And now in the last 30 years, massive production from corn, which can be produced very cheaply. We know glucose is important. We cannot live without glucose. We need energy, especially of our brain. But fructose is a very interesting molecule. It can be absorbed very easily. And it strictly goes to the liver, where it's converted into fat, which is a bigger molecule, 16 to 18 carbon. Glucose is six. And fat can be converted to cholesterol, which is an even bigger, complicated molecule of 27 carbon. Now, a very typical example of how fructose work is, look at the bears we have. Living in Vancouver on the North Shore, we have bears coming down to look for food in the autumn. And they will look for mostly berries and plums. They can use this to make 100 kilograms of fat for them to hibernate. They don't have any high protein or fat intake. The same with fruit. I always have fruit with my meals, not with an empty stomach. And I would totally avoid fruit juice, especially those that come manufactured one in cans and, cup and cups and all this. And because those juice, they are strictly sugar water, or mostly fructose as well, and there's no fibers in it. When I eat a fruit, I'm eating the high nutritional fiber, including the skin if possible, and they would delay the absorption of sugar or glucose or fructose into my blood. So when I choose carbohydrate, I look at white rice. We Chinese 
really like white rice. But it's a stupid way of eating rice because we don't eat the shell, which is very nutritional. And besides, the shell has a lot of fiber. And when we eat brown rice, it delays the absorption of carbohydrate into our blood. The word is congee. I call I name congee as a poor man's rice. When there's not in, enough rice to feed the family, we tell the housewife to put more water in and serve more bowls. But congee is dynamite because we absorb the very well digested already uh, rice in the congee, just like drinking sugar water. And I always have, as I mentioned before, a good morning meal and less evening meal. And when I go to dim sum, I choose that with more meat than simple sugar. In fact, at this stage, I should remind everyone that now available in Canadian Diabetes website, Chinese version also giving you advice what to choose when you go to a dim sum. I also totally avoid artificial sugar. While it has no calorie, didn't, it will not raise my sugar, but it will pamper my brain to make me more prone and more eager to have more dessert later on. After all, 500 years ago, humans lived quite well without sugar. So what about fat? They are good and bad and ugly. Now fat will give us, when we have fat in our diet, it will delay the absorption of sugar and increase our satiety so that we don't get hungry so quickly. But if we have too much fat, it will be all stored in the tummy, become a topic fat and insulin resistance. I'm no dietitian or nutritionist and I refer you to them for more detail how to choose fat. But suffice me to say that saturated fat is not all bad. And also we focus on the unsaturated one. What saturation means is, if you look at the diagram on the right side, fat is made up of 16, 18 carbon, and each carbon needs a partner in, in fact, two partners, which is hydrogen. And when there's not enough fiber, we call, I mean, not enough hydrogen, it will be uns unsaturated. So the saturated one have no double bond, and this unsaturated one are the ones that we want to have more that comes from nuts and olive oil. The trans fat are the ones that we make commercially, and that's the one that will increase your cholesterol and prone to heart and coronary artery disease. I should also mention this small fatty acid between two to four carbon. Actually, they are made by the germs that in our large gut. And they make them if we have more fiber that not absorbed in the small gut and come down to the lower gut to nurture those good germs or bacteria. And this short chain fatty acid absorbed in the lining of the colon actually can protect us from developing colon cancer. So what is exercise? People used to ask me, well, Dr. Lau, what do you do? What kind of exercise should I do? How much should I do? And when do I do it? My principle is you have to develop a habit of doing it. You enjoy doing it. You don't punish yourself. You don't pay big dollars to go to the gym or join very fancy clubs. It should be able to do it regardless of the weather. The best thing is in-house, in your house. One hour, half of your big meals. That's the time when you want to get rid of this sugar and fat coming in from your food intake. Don't put it in your tummy, but burn it in your muscles. So you could take different forms, like I avoid taking the elevator. I take the stairs up, 
but I don't come down the stairs because I don't want to hurt my knees. I take the elevator, it's available. And I put an exercise bike or an exercise step ladder in front of the TV so it becomes more enjoyable. The name of the game of exercise is to speed up your heart rate sufficiently in order to bring more sugar and fat from the blood into the muscle. I play Tai Chi several times a day, but I know that Tai Chi is not going to burn my fat. Tai Chi is good because it improves my posture and also improves my balance, which I need very much as I grow older. Before I finish, I should talk about herbal medicine because we Chinese have been exposed to herbal medicine and I did the same thing when I grew up in Hong Kong as a little boy. But actually, there are two diabetic pills come from herbs. Metformin come from this beautiful French lilac flower and the new one come from the apple tree bark is this SGLT2 inhibitor. S is sodium, GL is glucose, T is transporter. This molecule they extract from the apple tree bark help to block the kidney tubules so that not all the glucose, which is a good molecule, is reabsorbed back to the body. But 50%, up to 50% of the glucose will be excreted in the urine and by doing that, you lower the blood glucose without insulin and you also force the body to burn fat to lose weight. A more convincing way of using herbs is not what I did when I was a little boy. Put it in a pot, boil it for a few hours to 100 degrees. It destroys all the molecules. Of course, it's safe because it also destroys all the toxin. A good example is the Nobel Prize given to Dr. Chu. She is a, an 80-year-old phytochemist in Beijing now. The prize was given to her because of a discovery of a molecule that made a very useful malaria drug. She actually did that in 1960s. She read a Chinese medical uh, literature back in about 200 AD and she extract this molecule not boiling in water but use ether at about 30 degrees from this plant Artemisia and this pill has saved thousands and millions of lives from malaria especially children in Africa. This is the way to use herbal medicine. We don't cut trees, we don't eat flour, we don't chew bark. So the take home message I can offer you today is we have to recognize that type 2 diabetes is epidemic. It's going to be a big financial problem to the rest of the world including Canada. The culprit of type 2 diabetes is ectopic fat that we have to get rid of. And every Canadian should pay attention to this epidemic, not only those who have no diabetes yet because it involves everybody. We have to prevent, control, and end diabetes. So I welcome every one of you to make your comments and pose some questions if I can answer. Thank you and I want to thank Diabetes Canada and all of you that allow me to share what I have gone through in the treatment of diabetes for my patients and myself. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lau, for providing us with some very great insight into the perspective of diabetes, especially with the Chinese lens. So now, as you said, we will take some questions. Um, and for the questions that we don't get to, please feel free to email us at webinars at diabetes.ca, and we'll be sure to get back to you as soon as possible.
So Dr. Lau, with that being said, I'll start with our first question here. Um, I know you've spoken to herbal medicine, and so one of our participants has asked, can herbal medicine be a replacement for current medication that people are using to manage diabetes? Well, I'm more skeptical of herb without knowing exactly what it is. I myself, even uh, growing up with that, I would not take just herb itself because there's so many chemical gradients. In fact, now I'm very hopeful that there are more scientists looking at it in a scientific way. In fact, just recently, I know that in Shanghai, the group of scientists has discovered a molecule called betulant, which comes from the bark of a birch tree. And this molecule literally can help our liver to burn fat and this will be something coming. So I'm all embracing the use of herb, but it's the method of using it. We should be scientific enough to get the molecule out. The same example I used to give, I give gift of a diamond to my little wife, but I don't give her the stone that has diamond in it. It doesn't look good. That's my answer. Great. Thank you so much for that explanation. Um, Dr. Lau, you had mentioned Tai Chi, and I'm just wondering if a participant is asking here, is it enough to do Tai Chi? And if not, what other activities or physical activities can they do and implement in their day-to-day living um, that will help them manage their diabetes? And is there a time of day that might be best to do it? Well, the timing, if I only have limited time, I would do it one hour after a big meal, whether this is a supper, usually, or uh, after your lunch, if you have a business lunch, you know. So you go back to your office, you climb the stairs instead of taking the 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 elevator. And and as I mentioned earlier, the the reason why the time is so important is that's the most efficient time to burn the fat and sugar, which is very high in the blood, an hour after a big meal. And Tai Chi, as I mentioned, is a good exercise, but don't expect Tai Chi that burn, that you lose weight from it. I do Tai Chi every day in the morning and before I go to bed and as much as I can during the daytime for my balance and more importantly, my posture. Because when I'm sitting in front of the TV, I have to remind myself in my Tai Chi uh, maneuvering, I'm sitting straight up. I'm standing up straight, so I should sit straight up. And also the balance, and also it lubricate the joints. For some people who have arthritis, and if it's not hurting enough, the Tai Chi would how to do to, to just like a physiotherapy. That would be my answer. Great. That was a great explanation. Thank you so much, Dr. Lau. Um, Our next question here is, an individual's parent is living with type 2 diabetes and they do not feel comfortable discussing their care plan with their family. Is there a way that you might recommend them to address this or to be able to be a good support to their parent living with diabetes? Very good. Uh, this is good children. I, li- I hope my children do the same thing to me too in the future. Uh, of course, uh, you, uh, looking after parents with diabetes is almost like you have diabetes itself. Uh, besides, you may have a chance of becoming diabetic and say, oh, so it's never too early to learn. So if I'm one of those, I would uh, try to go to all this seminar, like attending a webinar like this, and visit the website of a uh, of uh, uh, Diabetes Canada where you get all the resources. You can download what you should eat, how you should play, and uh, all the, and what the uh, physiology and anatomy of uh, diabetes. And this is, knowledge is power. And knowledge is something we can do to prevent, control, and you and to cure. Great. Thank you for that, Dr. Lau. Um, A next question here, and Dr. Lau, I know you had discussed rice and different options to choose, um, but do you also have a suggestion or a recommendation around how many meals a week um, would be a maximum to include rice in? Now, that is a 
very difficult question because it applies to a different individual. Then, uh, uh, as to the impact of how much rice you have, the most scientific way I advise my patient is, okay, uh, one person can tolerate a big bowl of rice, but the other one cannot. Or even at different stages of the disease, there were different degrees of tolerance. The best outcome is you have your bowl of rice. Two hours later, you prick your finger. You see how much your glucose go up. That will tell you that this is too much for you. So you have to reduce the, uh, the size or change the, the type. Or if you have rice, white rice, you don't have pure white rice. Nobody does that anyway. But you should have some other meals, uh, some other item that will inhibit the absorption of carbohydrate, make it slower. Like if you have some meat, lean meat, and more fibers. And in fact, one trick I have, uh, uh, if I uh, really like uh, too much fruit, so with an empty stomach, which is not supposed to do, then I could have some high fiber uh, cereal. And I would have a mix up of some peanuts and almonds. And, uh, and if it's too hot, chop it up. Or um, use a Vitamax and make it in a little paste. So those are the tricks that I use to lower my, the, uh, my, my glucose. Another trick I do is I love noodles. And if I really cannot receive a noodle, a bowl of noodle, then after that two hours, I walk on, up and down the slope where I live uh, outside the house. And I show that if I don't do that, my two hour PC glucose can go up to about nine or even 10. But if I did that, uh, half an hour of this walk, enjoyable walk, of course, then I can get it down to 5.8. So that's my strategy. Exercise. Half the meal. Great. Thank you so much for that explanation, Dr. Lau. Um, and we'll just take one or two more questions here still. Um, so our next question here is, are you aware of any financial assistance programs or coverage that might be specific to the Chinese population? I wish I know. Uh, financial assistance, I'm not sure that uh, uh, you can get money to help you to buy the drugs. Notoriously, in BC, we are the least covering uh, province. Uh, there's a, a lot of the uh, good, like the new the, uh, apple tree bark uh, molecule. It's expensive. It's excellent for certain people. It's $3 a pill and uh, not anybody can afford it. So the, we hope mostly to, to, unless you have your medical insurance from work, uh, from your spouse work, and it's tough. There's no the ready fund uh, sitting around that you can draw from to help you to manage your diabetes. Sorry. No, not, not a problem at all. That, that was a great response. Thank you, Dr. Lau. And we'll just finish off by taking our last question here. And again, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this question with all the knowledge, but um, are you aware of any promising research that's happened in the last little while that's bringing us closer towards a cure for diabetes? The ultimate is to be able to get or build more beta cell. I'm very excited when I learned the two Japanese uh, a few years ago described their ability to use four transcription factors to reprogram uh, ordinary cells like the ones from our skin into stem cells and be able to direct it to become beta cell. So this is the ultimatum because there's no need to get donors to for transplant, transplantation and there's, uh, uh, you can have all the gadgets of uh, insulin pump uh, or even glucagon pump, but it's still not as bad as you grow your own beta cell. So this is something a little bit more distant in future. It sounds good. We have now four transcription factors that can program it too. But the problem facing right away is it may become cancer cell. In fact, in a mouse model, they find out they make a cancer called teratoma, which is a multi-organ cancer. And so we need to know a little bit more about how to guide the pathway. And I think this is possible. It's coming. 
That's great. Thank you so much for your insight, Dr. Lau. And folks, that does conclude our webinar for today. I'd sincerely like to thank Dr. Lau for speaking on behalf of Diabetes Canada. It's been a very great learning experience um, for everyone that's participated today. I do want to remind everyone that we are recording today's presentation and it will be made available on our website at diabetes.ca in the coming weeks. As you see here on the slide, this is a list of some of the additional resources that are available to you. Diabetes Canada has a Chinese information line, which is a toll-free number, and that can be reached by dialing 1-888-666-8586. And if you're looking for additional information and resources, you can either visit the Diabetes Canada Chinese portal or Diabetes Canada resources, which are in Chinese, and that's through our guidelines. So please feel free to visit those websites. Um, in addition to the sites here, we have included some resources. The resource section is located to the bottom left-hand section of your screen. Um, and all of those resources are written in traditional Chinese. So please feel free to download them to your desktop. Um, they're very helpful resources and they discuss things about basics around diabetes as well as weight management and physical activity. We've also included some resources there, um, which may be helpful and uh, useful for you to use. So we hope you enjoy those. We have two more upcoming webinars that are part of the Culturally Relevant series. So next week on April 6th, we have the Living Well with Diabetes is from a South Asian perspective, presented by Dr. Ali Prabhdani. And the following week on April 12th, we have Living Well with Diabetes, an Aboriginal perspective, presented by Teresa Salzman. As well, coming up in May, we will have our next series from Diabetes Canada that will focus on healthy living. So please stay tuned for that, and we look forward to your participation in the future. And for those of you looking for additional support and resources, please feel free to call our 1-800 number. That's 1-800-226-8464. We thank you for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed learning with Diabetes Canada, and we look forward to your participation in the future.